popular college graduate. He was probably the favorite guy on the team. Gets a little too rowdy with some friends in South Carolina. He got kicked out of the club. And never makes it back home. He said, Mom, nobody know where he is. His family wonders if a close friend may not be telling the entire story. For him not to say anything, you know, that's just strange. In Arkansas, a high school honor student goes missing. She was getting ready to go to college. But a promising new lead emerges in a story we told last season on Find Our Missing. I want to know something that could put an end to this nightmare for us. More than a decade later, police may have found the final piece of this puzzle. The investigator told me, you need to be down here. We're going to serve a warrant. It's a familiar scene at every college homecoming. A group of alumni catching up, hoping to relive the good old days. That's exactly what Brandon Graves was doing one night in late January 2010. But when things get a little out of hand, he's kicked out of a bar. When Brandon's family cannot contact him the following morning, they sense that something is not right. Most disturbing is that no one, not even the good friend who was with him at the bar, seems to know what happened to the guy that everyone affectionately called Peanut. Brandon Graves celebrates homecoming with friends in Sumter, South Carolina. As the night progresses and more liquor is poured, Brandon gets rowdier. He gets escorted out of the club. Minutes later, Surveillance footage from the bar captures Brandon at the club's entrance, trying to get back in. The bouncers turn him away. Where he went, or what he did in the moments right after, is a mystery still waiting to be solved. 24-year-old Brandon Graves lives life to its fullest. Not even a playful childhood nickname can keep Brandon down. Peanut, that's what we called him, Peanut, because he was the smallest one. He was short, you know, small in stature, but his heart was way bigger than his stature was. Born March 12, 1985, Brandon Graves never knows his father, and his mother dies of pneumonia when he is a toddler. His Aunt Martha and her spouse, Edward, raise Brandon as their own. I had him ever since he was three years old. His mama died, and I became the legal guardian and mother. He kind of fell in the mold as one of my one of my sons. Brandon grows up with his cousins in the small town of Little Rock, South Carolina, in the northeastern corner of the state. With a house full of boys, Edward and Martha look to religion to keep things under control. Everybody knew Sunday morning you go on to church. But Brandon's real love is sports, and he never lets his small size hold him back. He liked everything, but most of all, baseball and football. Brandon plays running back for his high school football team, and he's the catcher for the baseball team. Then Brandon heads off to Morris College in Sumter, South Carolina, about 70 miles southwest of Little Rock. During the fall semester of 2003, he joins the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. He's happy with his social life, but after freshman year, he switches schools in order to pursue a degree in sports management. In 2004, Brandon transfers to Coastal Carolina University, a school with a robust sports program, and he takes to it immediately. He loved Coastal. The football program, Coach Bennett, he loved it to death. At five foot four and 150 pounds, Brandon is too small to play college ball, 
but he still manages to get a position with the team. His outsized personality and dogged determination are all that it takes. We got to know him first when he showed up on a bus for an away game. He just jumped on the bus, he hid, he rode with the team. At first, Coach Bennett isn't sure what to do with Peanut, but the players assure him that his passion for the game will make him an asset for the team. Coach, you gotta let him stay. He found a way to get here, we gotta let him stay. And so, Peanut became uh, one of our managers. Brandon graduates in 2008 with a degree in recreation and sport management. He moves to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina and gets part-time work at a Nike outlet store while looking for a job. Hello? It's Brandon. Hey, sweetie. How you doing? I'm doing good. One winter evening, Brandon calls his Aunt Martha. I'm thinking about going to something tomorrow. He tells her that he's planning to maybe see some old friends from his freshman year at Morris College and attend homecoming festivities the next day. Ooh, seem like you're gonna have a great time. I talked to him that Friday, and he said that he might go to homecoming. He wasn't sure. The next day, his friend Maurice Whittington offers Brandon a ride to Morris College in Sumter. You coming to homecoming tonight? He attends a basketball game. Once there, Brandon calls his cousin Lamont, also a Morris alum, to see if he'll be joining in the festivities. He was like, bro, you coming? I was like, oh, I'm going to try to come. I didn't end up going. After his fraternity brothers win first place at a step competition, Brandon and one of his old college buddies, Matthew McMillan, arrive at a local club called Sebastian's Nightlife. Brandon has had a lot to drink by now and starts getting out of hand. You gotta go. What are you doing? Brandon and the bouncer get into it, and a little before midnight, the bouncer kicks him out of the club for being unruly. Alpha! Minutes later, surveillance footage captures Brandon walking back up to the club's entrance. Within moments, a bouncer can be seen escorting Brandon off the premises. This shot, showing him stepping out of the camera's view, is the last known image of 24-year-old Brandon Graves. On Sunday afternoon, almost 16 hours after the incident at the bar, Brandon's cousin Lamont gets a call from a family friend, Maurice Whittington. Man, nothing much, I'm just calling. Have you heard from uh, Brandon? Maurice is supposed to drive Brandon back home to Myrtle Beach this morning, but hasn't heard from him. He was like, um, did Peanut come home? And I'm like, no. Lamont finds out that Brandon was last seen at a bar with an old friend. He's like, nah, he went with his other buddy, Matthew McMillan, he was with him. Lamont calls Brandon's cell phone and it goes straight to voicemail. He then calls Brandon's frat brother, Matthew McMillan, to see if he's with him. Matthew, have you seen Peanut? Matthew says he has not. Yeah, I tried calling him and he ain't picking up. All I'm getting is voicemail. He was like, well, he went to the club and he got kicked out of the club, but we thought maybe he came home. And I'm like, no, like he ain't came here. Unsure where else Brandon might stay if he wasn't with Matthew or Maurice, Lamont is quickly growing concerned. He tries Brandon's cell phone several times. Man. No answer. Just for him to even not answer a call, it was like, no, this ain't like him. Lamont immediately calls his brother Reggie. I said, what's wrong? He's like, well, they can't find Peanut. You know, they said nobody's seen him since last night. Lamont holds off calling any other family members, not wanting to cause panic. That night, Lamont, along with another cousin, decide to go look for Brandon themselves. Having attended Morris College himself, Lamont still knows plenty of people who live in Sumter. The moment he arrives, Lamont starts talking to various friends, trying to get any information on Brandon's whereabouts. Several people confirm what Matthew had told Lamont over the phone, that Brandon got a little out of hand at the bar and was kicked out. 
Peanut wasn't really acting himself. You know, he's normally joking and stuff like that, but they said he was, you know, hollering out some names. But no one can agree on what happened to the 24-year-old right after he was thrown out of the club. At that point, you turn to law enforcement, and that's what we end up doing. On Monday, 36 hours after Brandon was kicked out of the bar, a worried Lamont asked the Sumter County Sheriff's Office for help in finding his cousin. Next, investigators begin retracing Brandon's steps. Apparently there was some situation that occurred inside the club. And a family mobilizes to find their loved one. We searched out, looking for him. But get stopped in their tracks. They actually called the police, and the police told us we couldn't be there. And local law enforcement says that this is the last known place William, brother Bill Johnson, was seen alive. Do you think the police know anything? Not at all. If they did, I'd be in cuffs right now. Goofy ass cops just fishing. You know, you've been a slick motherfucker as long as I can remember. But you actually fooled enough people for them to make you councilman battle. Oh. Damn. You've been a hater since high school. <laughs> Jason, where's the fucking shipment? Where's Twan at? Twan's in there waiting. Well, who's in charge since Bill is on a leave of absence? That depends who the fuck asking. <laughs> Turn around! It's a bitch. Fuck. Man, I ain't got shit at all, man. I don't want to overstay any job or position. I think that's the downfall in our community. You've been in the office 30 days yet. You already shaking me down? What, you want a receipt for your charitable contribution? So go on a good guy. Do I really have a choice? I'm still a goon. And I'm gonna get that bread. It's been 36 hours since Brandon Peanut Graves was last seen at a bar in Sumter, South Carolina. His cousins Lamont and Reggie are growing more anxious with each passing hour. It's heart wrenching. You know the stuff happens, but when it hits home, it's a hurtful feeling. At this point, all the cousins know is that Brandon, while celebrating homecoming, was kicked out of a bar called Sebastian's Nightlife. The cousins have already contacted the county sheriff. Now they must tell their family back in Little Rock the disturbing news. Peanut is missing. What are you talking about, Peanut is missing? He told me Peanut missing, and nobody know where he is. I said, what the world? It was just a shock. The next morning, several family members make the hour-long drive to Sumter to look for Brandon. They conduct their own search of the area where they know Brandon was last seen, Sebastian's nightlife club and its surroundings. We searched and we went to the place, walked the grounds. But the group doesn't get very far. The owners of Sebastian's nightlife are not happy about the family being on or even near their property. They actually called the police and the police told us we couldn't be there. So it was heartbreaking them because, okay, this is the last place he was seen, but now we can't be here. The next day, after the family departs from the area, officers head over to the nightclub themselves. The club owners cooperate with authorities. We were able to obtain video surveillance from the nightclub to show that he was there. The video confirms two things, that before midnight, Brandon Graves was escorted out of the club, and minutes later, tried to enter a second time. He was actually escorted off of the property by the club security. However, it's still not clear exactly what happened that night inside the club. After speaking to several of Brandon's friends, the family believes that Brandon was assaulted by a nightclub employee. 
that don't understand and I get it, that one of the bouncers threw him down or something. But authorities get conflicting accounts from the bar staff and Brandon's friends. Apparently there was some situation that occurred inside the club. I never got a real clear answer as to why. Brandon's friend, Matthew McMillan, who drove with him to the club that night, tells police that he has no idea what happened to Brandon after he was kicked out of Sebastian's. The family is disturbed by Matthew's statement that he doesn't know what happened to Brandon, since he was supposedly hanging out with him the whole night. Investigators do learn that Brandon had a cell phone on him the night of his disappearance. They now hope phone records may help pinpoint his location. While waiting to obtain those records, officers start asking other friends and family if Brandon had reached out to them the night he disappeared. They learn that between midnight and 4 a.m. on the night that he went missing, two calls were made from Brandon's phone. One was to a cousin named Keon Graves in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He did call one of our cousins, Keon, but Keon didn't answer. Brandon left a voicemail, but it's unclear. Keon said he couldn't understand what he was saying. The other call, similar to the first, came in around 3.30 a.m., and it was to a friend who wasn't even in the area. The person that received the call stated that he recognized Brandon's voice. <laughs> Neither his cousin nor his friend is able to understand what Brandon is saying in his voice messages. Come on, where you at? Family members say it's possible that Brandon may have been drunk when he made those calls, and that's why the messages are unintelligible. But they know that no matter what, Brandon would never go two days without checking in. We didn't know what was going on with these phone calls, you know, so, I mean, that, that was, that was nerve-wracking. Next, family members want to know what happened to Brandon after the surveillance video loses sight of him. He goes off camera with one of the security guards. And investigators kick the search for Brandon Graves into high gear. We had officers on four-wheelers, officers on foot. And later, the cold case of a missing teenage girl. This is our oldest missing person case. Suddenly turns red hot. They got two new witnesses who saw something suspicious years ago. On July 20th, 1969, while most of the country was glued to their television watching the Apollo 11 moon landing, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. A mysterious drowning left a family in shock, and a king's legacy lost in the shadows. Was his death an accident or murder? Alfred Daniel King. Love must be expanded, not only to our obvious enemies, but to those within ourselves. The younger brother of Martin Luther King Jr. was set to continue his brother's legacy. But just 15 months after Martin was assassinated. That's sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. That's okay. AD's life was cut short too. In this groundbreaking television event, we reveal the story of A.D. King, his legacy, his leadership, his death. I'm Ed Gordon. We'll tackle that question on the 50th anniversary of the King assassination with new details on the death of A.D. King. Unsolved History, Life of a King. Twenty-four-year-old Brandon Graves was last seen leaving a club in Sumter, South Carolina around midnight on January 31st, 2010. A few hours later, he leaves two incoherent voice messages, one for a friend, the other for a cousin. He hasn't been heard from since. As sheriff deputies investigate, they have reason to believe that Brandon didn't just disappear.
It's been five days since the last confirmed sighting of Brandon Graves. The Sumter County Sheriff's Office focus all their resources on the search for the fun-loving and charismatic 24-year-old. In this case, what we did was we got a search team out and officers on four wheelers, officers on foot, and helicopters come in. The search party covers the wooded area surrounding Sebastian's nightlife club, but there's no trace of Brandon. Investigators continue to try and piece together what might have happened to him after he was kicked out of Sebastian's. Rumors begin to swirl that Brandon got into a car when he left the nightclub and went to a second bar. I heard that he got into a white car and went to another club, and that's the last I heard. That other club, Blue Mist, is nearby. There was a report of him being seen at another nightclub. We also searched the area by the same means, using the same resources. But all efforts to find any trace of Brandon, including his phone or the clothing he was wearing that night, come up empty. Brandon's family waits helplessly as days turn into weeks before investigators finally get the cell phone records they subpoenaed. They hope the records will pinpoint where Brandon was when he made two calls, just hours after he was last seen. But investigators are disappointed when the records come back incomplete and do not show the location of where the calls were made. Authorities continue to hunt down clues. We check every lead that comes in, and with every lead, there's always a glimmer of hope. Brandon's friends and family members are certain that the 24-year-old would never want to distress his loved ones by just disappearing on his own. He wanted to make everyone proud of him, and I know he had great goals and aspirations uh, to do great things. As each day passes, the fear that something horrible has happened to Brandon intensifies. But the family tries to hold out hope for his safe return. I say every time something kind of come up at a dead end, there's still hope. I'm praying. Next, Brandon's cousin Lamont gets a revealing call from police. Well, well he's refusing. Why would he do that? The detective, he called, he was like, well, this friend, why he declined to take the polygraph test? That leads the family to believe that one of the last people to see Brandon might know more than he's telling. So my first thing was, OK, he has something to do with it. And local law enforcement says that this is the last known place William, brother Bill Johnson, was seen alive. Do you think the police know anything? Not at all. If they did, I'd be in cuffs right now. The goofy ass cops just fishing. You know, you've been a slick motherfucker as long as I can remember. But you actually fooled enough people for them to make you councilman battle. Oh. Damn. You've been a hater since high school. <laughs> Jason, where's the fucking shipment? Where's Twan at? Twan's in there waiting. Well, who's in charge since Bill is on a leave of absence? That depends who the fuck asking. <laughs> Turn around! It's a bitch, fuck. Man, I ain't got shit at all, man. I don't wanna overstay any job or position. I think that's the downfall in our community. We have been in office 30 days yet. You already shaking me down? What, you want a receipt for your charitable contribution? So for good and a good guy, huh? Do I really have a choice? I'm still a goon. And I'm gonna get that bread. College graduate Brandon Graves has been missing for weeks. His friends and family members in South Carolina are at their wit's end. Then Brandon's cousin Lamont says he gets a disturbing call from the Sumter County Sheriff's Office, which has been investigating the 24-year-old's disappearance. He refused the polygraph test. Lamont says the call leads him to believe that one of the last people who was with Brandon on the night he disappeared, his friend Matthew McMillan, 
may know more than he's been telling. The detective called me. He was like, well, you say Mr. McMillan is his friend. Why he declined to take the polygraph test? According to Lamont, the sheriff's office tells him that McMillan refuses to take a lie detector test about the night that Brandon disappeared. So I calls him on the phone and I'm like, well, uh, why you won't take the polygraph test? What's going on? If you didn't do nothing to him or you don't know what happened, ain't no reason you his friend, ain't no reason not to take the polygraph test. Lamont says that Matthew McMillan fell silent on the other end. The sheriff's department confirms that McMillan was asked to take a lie detector test, but that he refused. Authorities say they did question him, but do not have enough evidence to link him. His disappearance. I wouldn't say a person of interest, but he was the last person that Brandon was actually with, and we talked to him on several occasions. You guys are really close friends. You didn't come up to his aid. Authorities are left to wonder if Matthew McMillan was such a close friend of Brandon's, then why would he resist taking the test? Though Brandon's family has no proof that McMillan has anything to hide, they too wonder why an old friend and frat brother wouldn't want to help in any way he can. He was seen with peanut glass, and for him not to say anything, you know, that's just strange. My mama got Matthew on the phone and she said, well, if y'all got in an argument and he fell and bumped his head or whatever, just tell me that way I'm at peace. How come you don't want to take that test? And no response. Aunt Martha and the rest of the family are heartbroken by McMillan's silence. As months pass and the case turns cold, investigators follow the few leads that come in from family and friends. One tip leads investigators 30 miles from Sumter, South Carolina, to a homeless shelter where Brandon was supposedly spotted. But this man wasn't him. We had another tip that brought us to use our dive team. Yes, the tips do still come in. Of course, not as frequent as they did when it first started. We still haven't solved this mystery yet. Those who know Brandon well are certain that he did not take off on his own. They hold on to the hope that one day they will have answers. I think about him often. There's a story that hasn't been told yet about why he is missing. And I hope y'all can find that out. The family's strong religious belief helps them through the hard times. Just our faith in knowing that until we see different, Peanut's still alive. All we want is him home. Well, we're doing the best that we can. The whole family has gone through, but we're going through with one another, the bond with one another. But we are maintaining with the help of God. And that's a blessing. What happened to the vibrant Brandon Peanut Graves, who was just celebrating with his friends during homecoming weekend at his old college. Did he drink too much and disappear by accident, or did something more sinister happen to him? Matthew McMillan moved from Sumter a few months after his friend and fraternity brother went missing. McMillan did not return our calls, asking him to comment on the case and what he may know that could help solve the mystery. Help us learn what happened to Brandon Graves. Please call the number on the screen or visit our website, tv1.tv, for more information. In Arkansas, an update on a mysterious disappearance. This is our oldest missing person case. Blows wide open when two witnesses reveal chilling new details. They had their guns drawn and were all around the property. About 45 miles south of Little Rock, Arkansas, is Pine Bluff, a medium-sized city with a small-town feel. The name Clashendra Hall might not mean anything to someone who has just moved there in recent years,
But for those who have called Pine Bluff home since 1994, that name brings back memories of a bright and exuberant teenager who vanished in the night. After Find Our Missing first traveled to Pine Bluff in 2011 to report on Clashendra's story, investigators decided to look at her case with a fresh set of eyes. What they find puts this cold case back on the front burner. On a spring afternoon in 1994, Clashindra Hall is dropped off at work by her mother, Laurel. It's their routine. All right, call you when I'm done. I'll be working late. A high school honor student, Clashindra or Clea, is going to her after school job. This particular day, her boss had told her that she could come early because she was trying to get more money. Laurel expects Clea to call her later for a ride home from work, just as she usually does. More than a decade later, her mother is still waiting for her daughter's call. Clashindra Denise Hall grows up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, with three brothers in a tight-knit family. 18-year-old Clea excels in high school and has a world of opportunities ahead of her. In her senior year, she receives acceptance letters from several colleges and has a clear vision for her future. She wanted to be a pediatrician. She was smart enough to be anything that she wanted to be. Clea doesn't date much in high school, but toward the end of her senior year, she meets Scott Walker through a mutual friend. The 23-year-old is in the Army Reserves, and the two strike up a friendship. Scott was like in his early 20s, and for us, because she was our baby, that was too old. Her parents aren't thrilled about the relationship, but they trust their 18-year-old daughter will be responsible and keep up her grades. We had a standard that we had for our family, get your education and become productive individuals. With college around the corner, Clea wants to start earning some money of her own. Her friend Erica is employed by a charitable organization where she does clerical work. The program is run by Dr. Larry Amos, who works out of his home that he shares with his wife and family. Soon after, Clea joins Erica and begins working for Amos. On the afternoon of Monday, May 9th, her mom, Laurel, drops Clea off at Dr. Amos's office. Clea says she'll be working late. Do you need us to take you home? Just before 8.30 p.m., Clea's friend and co-worker, Erica, gets ready to leave the office. We all finished up at the same time, and I asked her, Clea, do you need us to take you home? She was like, no, I'm a walk. Clea doesn't normally walk home. Usually, she calls her mom for a ride at the end of her shift. But the change in her co-worker's routine doesn't concern Erica. On this particular night, Clea's mom dozes off while reading a book. After midnight, her husband Willie returns home from his weekly softball game. He checks the house every night and makes sure everyone's in bed before turning in himself. Just saw that she wasn't in her room. So that's when I went and woke my wife up. Is Clea still at work? No, she should be home. Well, I just checked her room and she's not in there. Let me call her job. In the mid 90s, most teenagers, including Clea, don't have cell phones. I called to ask her boss, is she still there? And he said, no, she left. Dr. Amos says Clea signed out with her timesheet at 8.30 p.m. 8.30? Maybe she wanted to stay out tonight. Her bewildered parents don't know what to think. Clea has never stayed out without permission before, and none of her personal items are missing. Something is not right because her clothes, her purse, her ID, everything is still here. Clea's parents spend a restless night contemplating several different scenarios. Maybe she went to a friend's house after work. Maybe she's just being a rebellious teenager. Maybe Clea wanted to spend some time with the young man she had recently befriended, Scott Walker. 
The next morning, Clea's parents are frantic. They head over to Scott Walker's house. We came knocking at his door early in the morning. Scott came to the door and was half asleep. Yeah, I'm sorry to be bothering you so early in the morning. When we were asking him about Clea. Have you seen Clea? Huh? I'm thinking, OK, maybe she stayed out and she didn't want to face me right away, so she went on to school. Willie Jr., Clea's younger brother, heads to school to check to see if his sister might have gone straight to their band practice before class. But there is no sign of her. By noon, Clea has not shown up at school. An anxious Laurel Hall calls Pine Bluff police to report her daughter missing. They tell her they can't do anything at the moment since Clea is 18 years old, legally an adult. The family must wait a full 24 hours before they can file the report. The wait is excruciating. 18 was just a number for me. She was still our child, not an adult. 24 hours to the minute after she last saw her daughter, Laurel is at the police department and files an official missing persons report. Pine Bluff police now launch their investigation into Clashindra Hall's disappearance. Authorities issue a bolo, or be on the lookout, for the young woman. 120 pounds, black, 18-year-old female. One of the first things they want to know is what kind of girl Clea is. Clea was a good kid. She was looking very forward to her future. And people that are working towards a goal, they're, they're just not like to run away. Confident that it's not personal or family problems that have caused Clea to disappear, investigators shift their focus to members of Clea's inner circle. Police search Clea's friend Scott Walker's car and apartment, but find no evidence of involvement in her disappearance. They also talk to Dr. Larry Amos, Clea's employer. The 18-year-old was last seen by a coworker the night before at his home office. Scott Walker takes a polygraph that comes back inconclusive while Dr. Amos declines to take one. His refusal to take the test makes Clea's parents suspicious of him. 